the edge with April Mahoney brains. Here, this is the place where the conversation is pointed, the guests are sharp, and the responses are never dull. <laughs> Welcome home, brains. Coming to you straight from San Diego, California. Let's welcome our host, April Mahoney. Welcome to On the Edge with April Mahoney Brains and Karina Fitch. She is a midwife, and we're going to talk about all things birthing. I love to coin the phrase, how are you showing up in the world? <laughs> well, she's literally going to tell us how she assists bringing children into the world. There's so many options, underwater birthing, assisted birthing, cesarean, surrogate, um, hypnotherapy. It, there's so many different options that women have now. We're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk about the pre preparation that we should have for our mind, our body, and our spirit when we are doing the work of our creator and delivering life onto the planet. But then what happens if there's a disconnect brains? You know, sometimes moms don't connect right away. And society has this quote unquote, whoops, lost an earring there. Yeah. Uh, uh, this idea of what it should be but it's not always that way so we're going to talk a little bit about that with all things uh wonderful in the world is karina fitch welcome welcome thank to you it's wonderful to be here on the edge i love thank the name so of your much. show by the way thank you me and my brains so tell us a little bit about you i i hear that you were born to a midwife in a very very uh, well what we would consider maybe not the norm unusual community and on a bus Tell yeah. about that. Yeah, so I was, I was born on a bus in the woods. It was like a converted school bus that was our home at the time. And that was part of an intentional community called The Farm, um, which was wait, wait, started. Now, now, what yeah. do you mean by intentional community? What does that mean? Yeah, so that's a community that is um, formed around certain basic principles. And those may vary depending on which community you're living in. Can I ask this question? Because I just kind of want to draw the real picture and I'm not being judgmental or anything. This is the only terms that I know. Is it yeah. like a commune a, com a, a commune, or not a cult, a, not that, but were they more free spirited, you know, more like hippie? Sure. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It was, it was founded by a group of about 250 San Francisco hippies okay. that, that were following a, a spiritual leader named Stephen Gaskin. Okay. And um, he, had a, he had a following. He used to do like a meditation class and he was sort of combining Eastern spirituality with Christianity and the psychedelic experience. And, and he had this following and they started to, he was traveling through the country, um, giving lectures at universities and all of the people from San Francisco that were really into him started, decided, well, we're going to, we're going to go with him. And so there was this whole caravan of buses and they ended up finding some cheap land in Tennessee and deciding to live their, you know, live this philosophy that they were so um, entrenched in and build their own community. Okay, so, I was just really trying to get clear. That's what I assumed, but I wasn't sure. So it was free love and that was good. So now I get, I get the idea of the farm and the bus. Okay, so pick it yeah. up. <laughs> so not so much, I, not so much free love, but it was, you know, people, it was based on, um, the principles of nonviolence, sustainable living, and and you know peaceful living, and then and then um, kind of being in service to the world. Okay. And so, so midwives were a central part of the community, and birthing at home was just what you did. It was it was the norm. So I grew up thinking that was just the normal thing, um, and that a lot that really gave me a strong foundation of trust in birth. Uh, whereas most people have to, uh, when they when they get pregnant or if they decide they want to be a midwife, they're they're fighting a lot of cultural uh, constructs around birth that have to do with pathologizing pregnancy and birth or fear, uh, fear based. And so I didn't have that, thankfully. Um, my mother started on the on the farm to attend births as an assistant to the midwives. And when we left the farm, when I was 10 years old, we moved to South Florida and my mother continued to attend births as, as an assistant with midwives and she would come home and share the stories. And so from when I was about 12, I knew that I wanted to be a midwife. What is the role of a midwife? What does she actually do versus a registered nurse or a clinical nurse? 
What is or an, op- or an obstetrician. Um, so a midwife cares, her, her specialty is normal, uncomplicated pregnancy and birth. And she's really an expert in those things. She's also an expert in community birth settings, meaning birth that's outside of a hospital. So her role is, is really the same in a way as a, as a physician or an obstetrician in terms of providing prenatal care, providing intrapartum or care during delivery, and providing postpartum care. However, the way in which she goes about that is, is very different from an obstetrician. Um, because we are, the midwifery model of care looks at birth as a normal physiological process that is best aided, most of the time, best aided by um, not intervening and simply monitoring for any possible problems. Whereas the medical model is kind of always on alert looking for problems and, and often through excessive intervention, creating problems that actually didn't exist before the intervention. Right. Um, so we, we tend, you know, we spend a lot more care with our clients, a lot more time with our clients, uh, providing very personalized care. So for example, in my practice and, and most of the midwives that I know, we spend about an hour at each visit one-on-one with our clients. So we're not only doing all the physical assessments like blood pressure pulse, measuring the baby, listening to the heartbeat um, or lab work, but we're also asking her like, well, what's going on with you? Like, how, how are you doing emotionally? What symptoms are you experiencing? And we provide a lot of education around um, ways that they can care for themselves. And most of us, you know, do an assessment of their diet and offer feedback. Um, we make sure that they're exercising regularly, that they're getting enough sleep, that they're, they're handling their emotional stress in a, in a healthy way. So it's a much deeper relationship built on mutual trust, mutual respect. We believe that the client is the person that knows best what she needs for her birth, for her baby. And so our job is to provide unbiased information for her to make informed decisions. So again, uh, you kind of go through the whole pregnancy. Yes. From, you know, from, from beginning to end. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, there are a lot of options out there to give birth. I yes. Really, I couldn't believe it. I had some other guests that were on my show that talked about hypnobirthing. And mm-hmm. then I did Lamaze when I had my daughter. Um, and then there's underwater birthing. You assist with all of these different modalities or do you specialize in one? Um, I assist in all of them. I, Lamaze is not so popular anymore, although the idea of using your breath um, to help to manage the pain is definitely something that is still a big practice. I, I'm sort of partial to the birthing from within modality, which is a childbirth preparation um, philosophy that really looks at birth as a rite of passage. And so the, the three givens from the birthing from within model are, it's, it's hard work, about, the three givens about labor, it's hard work, it hurts a lot, and you can do it. Um, whereas hypnobirthing sometimes portrays more of like this idea that you could birth without any pain. And I've seen hypnobirthing be an amazing tool for women. I think it's great. I think it's another great tool to have in your toolbox. But I also like women to be prepared for the very real possibility that they're going to experience some pain or some intense sensations, however you want to name it. Yes, uh, baby. You know. I did. So I'm, <laughs> one time, okay? And I said, uh, can I have a little demo, please? <laughs> right. And, you know, but it was within its time, you know, it was a wonderful birth, but I had to get the edge off. And yeah. there's people that have uh, epidurals. That's, that scared me a lot. Because again, that's more of a risk. Anything that you put in your body when you're giving birth could be a risk. So sure. what are some of the techniques that you teach women uh, to do it and not need artificial things to numb them? Yeah. Well, I think just the fact of giving birth outside of the hospital setting, whether you're at home or you're in a birth center, um, you have the freedom of movement. You can move in whatever ways alleviate your pain or um, in whatever position you want to birth in. So that goes a long way there. You know, most women will tell you that being flat on their back is the absolute most painful, um, worst position to be in during labor and birth. And yet that's the position that 
most women are in in the hospital setting. So that freedom of movement is certainly one thing. And then the ability to eat and drink during labor is going to provide you with the the necessary um, you know, nutritional resources that you need to do that hard work of labor. And then we also teach you know, different uh, counter pressure techniques or massage techniques that the partner can do. There's also aromatherapy and the water. So water is kind of, we call it, sometimes we call it the epidural of natural birth because it really helps to relax the mom. It lowers blood pressure. It can help speed dilation as long as you get in at the right time in labor. If you get in too early, it's also kind of like the epidural where if you get the epidural too early, it can slow things down. But um, it really allevi helps to alleviate the pain and uh, relax the muscles. And then for the baby, if they birth in water, you know, in theory, it's a smoother transition. They're going from water to water. Um, and then they, you know, then they come right up. They don't stay underwater. Wow, that is wonderful. And so you do this in people's homes. I do, yes. And, and in my own experience giving birth, I had um, two water births. And I can say both as a midwife and as a laboring woman that the water is an incredible tool in labor. It really um, takes the edge off. <laughs> really, well, we're on the edge, okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And birth takes you to your edge. And I mean, I think that's part of the beauty of birth is that it really, I truly believe it is a rite of passage. And it's not designed to be something that's easy. It's designed to be something that takes you to your edge and, and beyond. And then you come out of it feeling like, wow, I, I brought this life into the world and that was really hard and I didn't think I can do it. And then I did it and, right. and how empowering that is and how much that prepares you for the long journey as a parent, as a mother. But what happens when people run into stumbling blocks, you know, um, for a whole bunch of host of reasons? you know, that they don't necessarily bond right away. It's not that you don't connect. I had right. my postpartum moment. She was crying and I was lactating and you're trying to cook and all that kind of stuff. It, I was just overwhelmed. I didn't go through it through a long period of time, but it was just enough to let me know that this is a real condition. Yes. And, you know, society assumes because you give birth as a woman that you're going to be this phenomenal woman, this phenomenal mother. You're going to give, give, give. You're going to be able to uh, nurse your baby. Uh, you're going to be all these things that they think, but sometimes it doesn't happen. Talk yeah. through that. And because I know that you do some work with some women uh, that have postpartum. Yes. The baby. Yes. I, um, I have a postpartum support group that I hold monthly and I have personal experience with postpartum depression myself. And, and perinatal mood disorders, so depression, anxiety, um, either during pregnancy or, or postpartum, is actually the most common complication of pregnancy. So this is something that we absolutely need to be talking about. It's something that um, is very real and affects not only mothers, but you know, their children and their families and, and communities. And so... Um, it can, it can be triggered by many different factors. It could be triggered by trauma during the birth. Um, it could be triggered by, you know, or could, you, could, you would be at a higher risk if you had a previous history of anxiety or depression. It could be triggered by relationship issues and hormonal. There's a lot of different factors. Um, but the bottom line is that women need, I think number one, mothers need more real preparation for what it is to be a mom. Uh, we need to let go of these cultural constructs that you just spoke of about being this, this martyr or this superwoman. You know, these are sort of old archetypes for motherhood that I, I um, feel like we need to move away from as a society. And after I gave birth to my third daughter, um, I had been studying transformational facilitation also for a couple of years. And I created this idea of um, and an organization named Motherfly. And Motherfly is basically like a new archetype for motherhood that is saying no to the idea of martyrdom, where we basically give up ourselves entirely and get swallowed whole by this identity of being a mom, and we don't ex exist for any other reason. That's like, you know, that comes from thousands of years of patriarchy that says that as women, our worth is defined by either our physical beauty 
or our ability to give care. And then with, with the rise of feminine, feminism in the 70s, that first wave, we kind of went from martyrdom to super mom, where now we're like, we're just basically added stuff to our plate. You know, now we, have, we can have the career and we can have the, the partnership and we can be a mom and we can do it all and we, when we need to do it all perfectly. And so who's not gonna crumble under that pressure? Right. And then we and then you add in that the fact that we have no um, there's no societal and cultural support for this huge transition that it is to go from being a, a woman to be being a mother or being a mother of one to a mother of two or a mother of four to a mother of five. There's no paid maternity leave. There's no paternity leave. And so um, a lot of it, I think, has to do with with losing many postpartum traditions and um and and this the way that we live in nuclear families mm -hmm. right so we think that this is the norm but really it's only the last hundred years that we're in these nuclear families before that it was a village situation right. and we've all heard that term it takes a village to raise a child but it also takes a village to raise a mother and when we give birth to a baby, we're not just giving birth to a baby, we're giving birth right. to ourselves as mothers. Absolutely. And um, I know for me personally, being a mom is the hardest thing I've ever done. And, and midwifery is not easy, <laughs> you know? Right. Midwifery is like a 24 seven on call, you're dealing with life and death situations, um, you're dealing with a lot of deep emotional stuff. Um, and, Yet for me, being a mom brought up my inner critic more than anything else that I've done in my life. And over, you know, just, the, you know, the, the hormonal shifts in the beginning, you know, your hormones are all over the place. You're now very sleep deprived. If you're breastfeeding, you know, your nipples may be sore, you may be engorged. And it's just such a vulnerable time. And in cultures throughout the world, for many, many years, it was understood that during this time, the mother was in a very vulnerable place. And so she needed to be held by her community. She stayed home for 40 days. She was given specific foods, warming foods. Um, she was, you know, bathed and just really like cared for as if, right. as if she was a baby. So it's like, this, uh, there's a woman, Julia Jones from Australia, that has a, um, a program called the Newborn Mothers Collective. And she kind of coined that term, newborn mother. It's like, when you become a mom, you're a newborn. You're, you're, you're a new mom. And so you need, we all, everyone wants to hold the baby, but, but who's holding the mom? Right. That's beautiful. That, exactly. Because there's a lot of stuff that goes on after that. And, you know, what, what you're going home to. Is there a good relationship when you go home? Is there somebody to help support you, take care of you, take care of the other kids? All of that. Right. So it does take a village. It really does yes. take a village. So tell us about um, the, don't you have an online program now? Yes, I, I do. Um, I have, so I have an online program called Replenish Your Essence which is for moms um, that are wanting to, that are feeling either, you know, isolated, overwhelmed, or at the worst, maybe depressed. Um, and it's really designed to help moms move from survival and isolation and overwhelm to inspiration and thriving and reawakening their passions, reconnecting with themselves, not only, you know, re reconnecting with themselves outside of motherhood, not to disconnect, from their role as a mother, but rather to enrich and redefine that role and bring more of themselves to it. And, um, and I'm actually launching that in April. Um, I have another program that's a longer program called Mother Birth mm -hmm. that's for pregnant women. And it's really combining the, the feminine power work that I've been studying um, along with my own journey as a mother and a midwife for, for many years to help um, really take on pregnancy for what I believe it, it truly is uh, an opportunity for, which is incredible transformation and growth. Um, you know, it's a time in your life where you're inspired to make positive changes because it's not just about you anymore. Right. You have this person inside you. And, and so it, it's mother birth is also like, it's preparing for your, that birth of yourself as a mother. So it's really a lot of preparation for the postpartum. You know, wow. we do all this stuff around making birth plans but we need to make postpartum plans Absolutely. because birth is one day of your life. 
maybe two, you know, if you have a long birth. But, um, you know, motherhood is forever. It is forever, and it's so important. How do you get a midwife? I mean, you know, they have them in the hospitals, but are you like a private practice, consulting, you know, because I know you had to have a lot of training and all that. How do you go out and, and recruit a midwife? And what should you yeah. do? Yeah. So there's different credentials for midwives in the U.S. Um, we have the certified nurse midwives, and those are midwives that did a, like a bachelor's in nursing and then went on to study midwifery. And they primarily work in the hospital setting, although some do work in birth, freestanding birth centers. And then there's direct entry midwifery, which is the type of midwife I am. And that's where you, meaning direct entry, meaning you just study midwifery. Um, I happen to also have a, an RN because I decided to, to go ahead and get that after I got my midwifery license. Um, but you want to look for a midwife who's credentialed, ideally, like a licensed midwife or a certified professional midwife or a certified nurse midwife. Um, and, you know, I encourage moms to interview several midwives and see who you really connect with because it's not just, you know, there has to be a chemistry. It's kind of like, you know, a relationship. Right. You, can't, you don't want to just go to somebody that you don't share the same philosophy or you don't have a, a chemistry with. Um, what is doula? So a doula is somebody who's, who's providing um, physical, emotional, and informational support for either during the birth um, or there's also postpartum doulas. Uh, actually, doulas were originally, it was a postpartum thing, and then it became something that, that people um, had during their birth. And so their sole purpose is to provide that emotional and physical support. And also in a hospital setting, advocacy is a big part of it, what they do, because right. unfortunately women do not get um, unbiased information in the hospital. They often get coerced into medical intervention that is either unnecessary or that they don't really want. And so the doula, um, part of her role in the hospital is to be an advocate for that mom. Yeah, I had a, an incredible story. Uh, one of my guests, she had nine miscarriages. Wow. Nine. Yeah. And so now uh, I saw that she had just posted, because um, God is good, a center that she's opened up to help women after they have experienced the trauma of a miscarriage. You know, they say one in three yeah. pregnant women will miscarry within the first trimester. And there is such a loss and sense of shame around that. I wish that we could have that conversation and women be more open to it. I mean, things happen, uh, you know, if the, the fetus was not in a great state and it naturally aborted, that's no problem. But nine was quite a number for me. And I kept wondering why she kept getting pregnant. And she said that she just wanted a baby. Mm -hmm. and, you know, but yeah. the emotional toil, Oh, wow, my I goodness, couldn't, yeah. I couldn't imagine. I couldn't imagine. Yeah. It's horrible. So yeah, I, and listen to listen to her show, uh, uh, Hassana Nine. It was one powerful story. Wow. Yeah, I, I had a miscarriage between my first and my second daughter. And and then it took me about a, almost a year to conceive again. And I, I mean, every every time I got my cycle, it was just like grieving that loss again and again. And it made me realize how much women hold that grief in silence because nobody knows what to say and because there's there's that shame that you mentioned and that um yeah there's just there's just not a space in in culture it makes people i don't even know if it's shame i think it's a, a sense of um you know what's wrong with me or I, i'm less than or you know why right. did this happen to me you know there's no right. favorites right you know, or my so body failed me you know, exactly. especially when it's repetitive, like, like your guest, you know, that can be really, really hard to recover from. But now they're doing other stuff. Girl, they have a surrogates. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. So I know that you don't do that, but just kind of, you know, for the sake of the conversation. So mm -hmm. they harvest the sperm, they harvest the egg, they bring them together in a test tube type of environment. The mother prepares her body you know a friend of mine says she went through in vitro she said it was hell she had to get mm -hmm. injections and all that to get the body prepared and then yeah. they insert this this life into the the mother's yeah. am, am mm -hmm. i correct and it yeah yeah wow. yeah 
I know it's it's amazing. <laughs> it is amazing. It is amazing, and a lot of people are opting that cesarean births. Now I know that you are an advocate of natural childbirth, vaginal birth. Um, yeah. You know, when you have a breech baby, you know, mm -hmm. what do you do? You try to help turn the baby, or you have special techniques. Yeah. You don't want to use forceps or anything, right? Right. Right. Yeah. No. So. Yeah, if we if we have a breech baby and and that's something that we've detected and prenatally, then we do. There's a variety of things you can do to try to get that baby to turn, including um, certain positions that the mom gets in, um, homeopathy, acupuncture, um, even you know talking to the baby. Sometimes people put like an ice pack by the baby's head to try to get the baby to to move, <laughs> um, to go head down. Or they put music in the lower, you know, in the pelvis that they think the baby would like, like put headphones there to try to get the baby to move toward the music. Wow. Um, there's all sorts of things. And then the last ver um, option would be what's called external version, where they, the baby is moved from the outside um, just by placing the hands on the belly and kind of rotating the baby. Wow. Um, that's not something that we are legally allowed to do in the state of Florida as midwives, but um, there are some physicians that will do it. And we, you know, and unfortunately, vaginal breech birth should be an option. Um, it really should be something that is presented as an option. But the problem is that there's very few providers that it's a lost skill that, that know how to do it because medical doctors are just taught, well, if it's breech, you just do a C-section. But particularly for moms that have already had vaginal births, um, the, the evidence shows that offering them a, a vaginal breach delivery is, a, is very reasonable. Um, and so, yeah, we really, we need to work very hard to reduce our primary C-section rate and increase our VBAC rate. Um, and VBAC is vaginal birth after cesarean. Wow. Wow. Well, you guys are doing some stuff. What do your kids think about this? You have three daughters, right? Yeah. Yeah. And when they see these babies pop out, well, they're used to it now. But when they first experience that, they say, Mama, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, they all, they all started attending births pretty young. Um, I would say they were, they were about six weeks old when they went to their first birth. Um, because when they're, when they're little, I would just wear them and um, take them to births with me because, you know, they nurse so often. And, and then as they, usually by the time they're starting to be mobile and crawl or walk, then I, I start leaving them home. But they, my middle daughter says she wants to be a, she calls it a wind mife. She says, I'm going to be a wind mife. <laughs> That um, is beautiful. That yeah. is beautiful. Well, thank you for sharing that experience with them. You know, a lot of people don't talk to their kids about sex. They don't talk to them about life. They don't see, you know, how um, that's when I first learned about sex is the dog had puppies. I watched the whole thing and I was like, wow, you know, but it answered all my questions and it wasn't right. a mystery. And yeah. then afterward, life and birth and, and all of those wonderful things where well, you were doing incredible work. You want to go back to the farm, back to the yeah. Tell yeah. Us about that. Yeah. Well, that? I um, you know, as I as I mentioned, I had you know an experience with postpartum depression and anxiety, and I um, it's been about it, it was about three years that I was going through this after the birth of my last daughter, and I you know it kind of felt like all of the different pieces of myself, the different pieces of my soul, were kind of scattered across time and space after after her birth, and trying to hold you know, being the primary provider, being the primary nurturer and, um, and being a midwife, you know, every, you know, t midwifery is 24 seven, being a mom is 24 seven. And a lot of the stress that I've had has been financial. And um, I, I went back to the farm over winter break this year with my girls and just felt such an incredible sense of peace and safety and mm -hmm. kind of like a homecoming. And it felt like, you know, I've really been wanting to transition from midwifery in the traditional sense being my primary bread and butter to the motherfly stuff because it allows me to midwife the spirit. It allows me to midwife women without having to be on call all the time. Um, but making that transition has been really challenging because I'm, I'm a single mom and, um, and I'm, a, I'm the provider. And so the farm is a place where I can, I can go and have a much lower cost of living um, and, and really begin to develop my motherfly work and give my, my girls this, this gift of 
being really connected to the natural world. Right. And, and this- Being raised in a village. And being raised in a village and being raised with this sense of safety that is, is not possible in, in urban life. You know, they might, the, the capacity, like my 11 year, or sorry, almost <laughs> she, 12 year old, almost 13 year old, right. when we were there, she was just like, okay, mom, I'm going to so-and-so's house and then we're going to the store and then we're going to the swimming hole and I'll see you back at the house at this time. And, and I know that, that she's gonna be okay. She can wander around like that. And that's, to me, a huge gift because when I left the farm, I was 10 and I didn't know, I didn't have the concept of like, you don't talk to strangers or you can't trust people. Um, until like the summer before we left, my mom started ingraining us with like these stories of kidnappers and things well, like that. Well, let me ask you a question. Let me have, okay, so now your children have had some of those, well, she's 12, so she's heard yeah. and seen and going on all the crazy stuff that's going on in the world and the schools and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. now you're going to put them into a more structured, reserved type kind of lifestyle. What happens when they reenter to society? Yeah. Well, it's a balance. I'm just, yeah, I think, I think, um, you know, for my oldest daughter, I think going back there is probably going to be the most challenging for her because she's had so much of the urban life and, and the social life of middle school. She was homeschooled until she started middle school a year ago. And, um, and at the same time, I feel like what a perfect time to go and, be in nature when she's going through all these internal changes with puberty and coming into herself as a woman and and not be exposed so much to all the noise of culture and society that tells you you have to look like this and you have to act like this and and just be able to be in her process of becoming um and then with my younger girls i think it's just going to be beautiful to be able to ride horses and walk in the woods and go to the creeks and i'm thinking of it as like we're going to go for a year and then we're going to see what unfolds from there. Um, but I, I really think that um, it's just going to be a grounding experience for them. And they, they, they know what it is to be here. And, and I think one of, the, one of the best benefits of urban living is diversity. My girls are mixed race. And that's really, it's important to me that they're around um, black folks and brown folks and all kinds of folks. And that's one reason why I've hesitated in going back to the farm because it is, it is very white, you know, there's not a lot of diversity there. Um, but actually when we went back in, in the winter, there's a, a new uh, member that moved back or moved there for the first time. She's Jamaican. She's got three daughters and her oldest and my oldest like really bonded. And so I was just happy to see some, some oh. people of color there. And I'm like, oh, okay. That's good. That is good. Well, you're doing wonderful work. Uh, thank you so much because this is a bit of a sacrifice. I know that it is a, a gift for you. It is a gift to assist in giving, you know, birth, giving life. Yeah. You know, folks, the way to show up in the world and yeah. how you show up in the world has a profound impact on how you're going to live in this world. Is it Absolutely. violent? Was it stressful? Was it loving? Was it caring? You know, did you get caught in the hands of a wonderful uh, midwife or a doula? All of those things. So, yeah. you know, Think about that as you go through your process. And I say this to you, Lady Brains, that, you know, sometimes you're having babies uh, and it's not the most ideal of circumstances, but you're giving life and that person is going to love you unconditionally. So hold that, embrace that, you know, take your time with it, get all the help and the assistance that you need. There are great programs uh, online, like Karina's program. There's women's support group, but get what you need to fill your cup, to help you and your baby survive in the most pleasant way possible. Tell my brains how to get in contact with you, Karina, please. Yeah, you can find me at uh, motherfly.mom, that's M-O-T-H-E-R-F-L-Y dot M-O-M, -M. Um, and also Belly Mama Midwifery, that's B-E-L-L-Y-M-A-M-A midwifery.com. And on Facebook, on the Motherfly and Belly Mama, I'm there. Um, Instagram, it's Motherfly Tribe and Belly Mama Midwifery. And um, that's so it. Get, get your belly midwifery on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm also a belly dancer. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So thank you so much again, uh, Brains. I'm wishing you the happiest birth. 
if possible, uh, you know, if you're going through a tough time, like I said, reach out. There's somebody to catch you. All right. Thanks a lot. Talk Thank to you later, you. Karina. All right.